Good evening. Welcome to the QCIS channel. We're on this channel. You get a daily dose of science, technology, engineering, and math. My name is Leon Jones, and this evening, I'm going to talk about the process of contract management, or we can call it the contract management process. Now, when I talk about contract management processes, I'm going to be very specific, and I'm going to utilize it within the construction industry. Now, in construction, there's construction management. Many of us know that construction management involves planning, it involves estimating, it involves documentation, scheduling, materials management, now, what I just gave you it was systems. So there's construction management and construction systems. You have cost engineering, accounting, value engineering, and you have different types of contracts. Contracts are design build contracts, design bid build contracts, unit cost contracts, lump sum contracts. But with all that being said, when we deal with contracts, they have to be managed. And even if you are a consulting engineering company, you also have a contract with your client. And in order to make it work, there are systems in place, such as when a consultant sends an inspector to a client, like, let me give you an example. If I work for, well, I did work for Hanson. So we won a contract with NDOT. Now, what we did is we sent NDOT a proposal. And that proposal had how many inspectors did we need for the project? How many designers did we need for a project? How many construction supervisors did we need for the project? And what we did to manage that contract, we had a fee structure. And we also had a budget that we had to be within. And we also had to keep our own time. Now, when we we're getting close to going over the budget, we'd have to submit a change order so we can get more money. Well, if you think about contracts, there are different types of contracts. When you deal with procurement and purchasing, you ever heard of purchase order contracts? Because contracts are a variety. When you get a credit card, you read that fine print and you acknowledge it, that's a contract. Contracts are all in writing, but there's a process when we deal with contracts. And I'm gonna show you within a construction industry of what I'm talking about. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to get right into the process right now. So we're going to talk about the contract management process. And what we're going to put together is how we're going to form the contract. So when we deal with contract management, and, and this is true. If you want to be in this business of contracts, 
Well, successful contract management covers the period from the beginning of a procurement until after a contract ends. So the receipt of goods and services at the right price, quality, and on time, as well as proper compensation of the contractor is the goal of a successful procurement. However, poor contract management often results in end user frustration, reluctance to use new vendors, agency acceptance of poor quality service or goods, increased cost due to the lack of quality or overpayment to contractors. And there's also a lack of contractor ability and generally poor contractor performance. So when we deal with a contract, if you want to have a good contract, well, what does it mean? Well, you have to look at a good contract. It's basically a means to an end. And what you're doing is simply enforcing a contract. However, it does not necessarily result in a successful relationship with the contractor. So when we deal with success, it should instead be measured by the effectiveness of the program that the contract supports. Okay, now when we outline everything in a contract, we have to, number one, develop specifications. And the reason why we develop the specifications is because we are actually specifying the need. And then you get into the risk to the agency. And the reason why you have to put in the risk because you have to protect the agency. And then what type of contract are we getting involved with? And what kinds of special terms and conditions of resulting contract or, insult, or resulting in any contract will eliminate risks. Also, when you, when you deal with contracts, going back to the type of contract, is it a job, is it JOC, which is job order costing, design bid bill, design bill, unit cost, lump sum, is it a contract that is with a design consultant? Because a contract for construction is different from a design consulting contract. However, there is a process to managing each and every type of contract. Now, when we break all the topics down from our outline, we start off with developing specifications. And why do we need specifications? Because we need to specify the need. So when we specify the need, what do we do? Well, we develop bid or RFP specifications. Now, when we mean RFP, we're talking about request for proposal which when we put everything together, we're developing a scope of work. And when we break everything down, we look at the scope of work as dealing with the elements because the element of a contract is most likely to create contract admission problems when we deal with the scope of work. Better yet, the element of a contract that is most likely to create contract admission problems is the scope of work. What type of work are you doing? And then the contractor's ability to interpret the scope of work determines contract performance. Then you have to deal with design specifications, because let me tell you something, design 
has a lot of liability. This is why you have E&O insurance, known as errors and omission insurance. Well, when we deal with the design specifications, what we're really looking at is we are describing specifics of a good design, such as the dimensions, physical requirements, materials, etc. Now, this type of specification gives an agency control because it determines exactly what the contractor must provide. Also, as I move it up a little bit, move it up. Now, one thing about specifications that you must understand, particularly, particularly when we deal with design, Sign also places an additional burden on the agency to ensure that the specifications are exactly as needed and to inspect or test the item to determine compliance. And that's the biggest thing. That's why you send inspectors out there on jobs. But you also have somebody critiquing your design before you send it out because a bad design can cause a bad project. Now, again, we have different specifications. Talked about the design specifications. Now we have to get into the performance specifications. Now, this type of specification is oriented to results and function. And within performance specifications, the responsibility for method or process becomes the responsibility of the contractor. However, the acceptance of goods or services procured through performance specifications is the responsibility of the agency, which greatly impacts contract administration. Let me give you that again. This is very important. Because remember, when we deal with construction, we deal with design, we deal with performance, we deal with specifications, this all goes into the contract and there's a lot of liability. This is why you have to have engineers and architects licensed because when it comes to building infrastructure, you have to look at the liability and acceptance of goods or services procured through performance specifications is always on a contractor or correction, it's not on a contractor, but the contract now the contractor is responsible for the method, whereas the agency is responsible for the goods or services procured or procured through performance specifications. So when you really look at what's going on here, what kind of contract manager? Are you going to have a construction manager? Are you going to have a GC? Or are you going to have a at-risk construction manager? Because both parties are responsible for their part of the contract. That's why we develop specifications. So you must do your due diligence. So you have to do the inspection of specifications. And this is why specifications are constantly changed. Why? Because there are always new development in the construction industry, such as materials, such as different methods of constructing infrastructure. But now we're looking at a lot of sustainability. How is that going to come into play when it comes to building cost-effective infrastructure? That's always examined. Now, what are contract risks to agency? And this is very important because the agency must be protected. Well, you have a proposal risk. A proposal risk is how well is the good or service described? Do the terms and conditions adequately protect the agency? Do the terms and conditions adequately protect the agency? So what you have to do is 
if you look at language, you must avoid all ambiguous language. That means language that we cannot understand or jargon. You have to integrate language regarding the method for evaluating the contract and contractor performance. Now, remember, when you utilize specifications, specifications determine the minimum qualification. So if you go above and beyond, that's great. If you go below the specifications, that's where the problems are going to occur, and that's where everything has to be fixed. Now, as I said before, we deal with shorty and reliability risk. Well, when we deal with engineers and contractors, we have to look at licensing, certification, bonds, insurance, data privacy, and warranties. And scheduling risks is a contract Delivery, is it going to be delivered in a timely manner? Is that insured? What are the risks to the agency again? Contractual risks or risk. Are the procedures for dispute, breach, and change order modifications? Are those procedures clearly outlined? And when we deal with performance risk, is the definition of agency acceptance clearly defined? And when we deal with the price risk, do payment terms fit the contract and minimize risk? So we deal with progress or milestone payments. They're also applicable. And again, what is the contract type? Well, we have goods and services, lease, construction, one-time goods purchases, professional services, capital outlay, non-professional service, and we have what we call software. Now, again, I said I was going to gear it toward construction, but a lot of this information is involved in construction as well. And when I talk about professional services, that's when I mean consultants. And then when I talk about software, well, for designers, what type of software are they using? They're, if it's a DOT project, most likely they're using MicroStation, if they are doing a building or any type of structural infrastructure, they could be using STAD, they could be using AutoCAD. If they want to utilize 3D, they could be using Revit or Civil 3D. Now, when we deal with projects, here's the Biggest item. And when I mean projects, I'm going to specify it a little better, much better. I'm going to say with contracts, because everything must be spelled out in a contract to what? Eliminate risks. So you have to ask the question to eliminate risks. What are both parties? representatives who are both who are the party's representatives both parties when i'm talking about the party i'm talking about the agency and the contractor now what are both parties responsibilities uh, details of inspection rejection who will inspect or reject contract administration team member change order procedure must always involve purchasing if a contract modification is required. And example, quantity increase would not require a contract modification other than 
a EVA purchase change order. Changes to the scope of the contract would require a contract modification. Add a building to a janitorial contract. Now, basically, what we did with change orders, now I'm looking at a PowerPoint. I did not write it. Quantity increase, depending on the percentage over, and this is where you get into your specifications. Like if you have a overrun on an item and it's 10% over the original quantity, you don't need a change order. Now that's only if the specifications Spell it out. Now, you can find all this information in your, what we call your, your general or your 100 specifications. Tell you about the payments. They tell you about the contract. Specifications. Uh, they, they tell you what to do for liquidated damages. They tell you Processing payments example. Now, when you look at change orders, what change orders basically do, they change the original contract price. And why is that? That's because you change the scope of work. Now, here's something you need to know, too. Key personal or personnel. Who is going to view any type of change order? Who will be involved? Who's going to evaluate the proposals or the constructability? Who will lead? Now, one thing that individuals do not do on contracts. Sometimes we don't know who the team is. And this is where you get into Project management. You're managing this contract if you have the right people in place and they're doing their jobs, you can manage more than one contract at one time. And there's also software like Procure software. There's scheduling software like Microsoft Project. Uh, used to be SureTrack. Uh, they have something else out now. Sometimes I forget the name of, I mean, the big one, the big one is out right now, Primavera. That's it. That used to be Shore Track. But you use systems to help you track the contracts. Finally, what you do, you have to outline breach and termination procedures, dispute resolution, warranties, acceptance, what constitutes acceptance. Now I'm gonna get more into that when I give you more contract documents. I'm gonna take some of these PowerPoints from a class that I took at Old Dominion University known as uh, CET 440, Contract Documentation, because most of us do not understand contracts. And although it's going to be taken from a construction standpoint, a contract is a contract. Everything applies. So we have breach termination procedure. We have dispute resolution warranties, acceptance, and payment. Now, payment does the vendor accept small church, small purchase charge card, payments 50K or less. Again, does the vendor accept small purchase charge cards or are payments 50K or less? And basically, when we deal with managing contracts here, look at the schedule. Have meetings. Record all of your meetings. 
part of the contract is payments. Now, again, overall, what type of contract are you dealing with? Because I specifically talk about construction, but it could be any type of contract. Understanding RFP, the request for proposal. Now, there was something that wasn't mentioned in the PowerPoint. There are a few other R's that start with request. You have an RFI, which stands for request for information. And then you have an RFQ. Now, an RFQ is re request for qualification. Now, if you are going to bid on a contract, you need to have a history. And that history is going to tell me that you're qualified to do the work that you are bidding. There are some that are not qualified. If you have to look at managing the contract. If it is a government contract, you have to meet what we call a DBE, WBE, MBE, VBE. That is part of the contract. If you are a consulting company, you have to also utilize the same procedure that a contractor was doing construction work utilizes as well with the DBEs. And if you can't meet the DBEs, you have to explain why you can't meet the DBEs. But overall, the whole purpose of contract management is to make sure that the project is being built according to plans, specification, and it's going to be completed on time and under budget. Now remember, when you look at contracts, Look at the scope of work. Look at the types of items. Look at the types of contracts. Some contracts may require drawings and some may not. Now, again, you might have a contract like a housekeeping contract. It's going to be the same thing as a construction contract, although it's not construction work. There's going to be a proposal that's going to spell out everything that, say, if you're doing a custodial contract, everything that is required to bid that job for housekeeper or janitorial work. It's going to have the materials. It's going to have the team. Also, it's got to have the insurance also part of the contract, due diligence. But regardless, whole purpose of contract management is to ensure that all work is being properly done. That's why we use specifications, tools now, specifications, schedules, drawings, proposals, and requests for information, submittals, safety, deal with shorty bonds, and insurance. And we can go on and on. But the basis of contract management is really common sense. Let's make sure that the contractor or consultant who bid on the work is doing exactly the work that they bid, no more or no less. And the agency is to make sure that the work that was bid by the contractor and the designer is being complied by way of using tools such as plans, 
specifications, and proposals. And that concludes this topic. That's right. That concludes this topic on contract management process. If you like what I just presented, please comment, share, and subscribe. And if you are looking for some political, some social content, check out my main channel, the 411 Talk Zone radio show channel, also on YouTube. Now, when I record all of my videos from the 401 Talk Zone radio show channel and the QCIS channel, I also post the 401 Talk Zone radio show channel videos on Twitter. Now I'm also posting the 401 Talk Zone radio show channel videos on Rumble and Truth Social. Now, for the QCIS videos, I'm posting those videos on my LinkedIn page since the, the LinkedIn is more of a education and professional page. And once again, thank you for viewing this content of the contract management process from the QCIS channel. We're on this channel, get a daily dose of science, technology, engineering, and math. Till next time, my name is Leon Jones. I want you all to have a wonderful and gracious evening.